Yeah, that's exactly what I would call it. Circular logic. Hey, you violated the law that may violate the Second Amendment, but because you violated the law, you can't be law-abiding and therefore aren't protected by the Second Amendment. It makes absolutely no sense. We are the Armed Attorneys. Today, we're talking about a really interesting case out of Minnesota, and it's one of these kind of peek into how the courts are running these things in the wake of New York State Rifle and Pistol Association v. Bruin and how they the different kind of ways they're going to weasel out of this. So you want to know what the courts are doing. But before we begin, show your support for the Second Amendment by hitting that like button. And today's brought to you by our friends over at Sonoran Desert Institute. Check them out at sdi.edu slash armed hyphen attorneys. Uh, they do online education for gunsmithing armor courses and so much more. sdi.edu slash armed hyphen attorneys. And today we're talking about the U.S. versus Danielson. If you want to check out this case, it's 22 00 and this opinion was just issued August the 17th, 2023. Now, this came up in the context of a motion to suppress, and we can talk about that a little bit. You know, that's when they're saying, hey, you illegally collected some evidence. Uh, we want you to keep that out of court. But in that uh, motion to suppress, there was a motion to dismiss. Right. And this is also an interesting case because it provides you kind of a little insight on police work and how the ATF goes about conducting its business. It all began with a confidential informant who was in prison. So basically, this the the one of the underlying morals is don't hang around criminals because they will turn on you in a second. Yeah. This confidential foreman basically said, "Hey, I got some information the ATF may appreciate. I know a guy who makes bombs and machine guns, machine guns and suppressors and everything." And so they then uh, took this confidential foreman, took his information, and then allowed him to basically engage in a sting operation where he went to this individual supposedly for the purposes of buying a an unregistered, unlicensed, uh, unapproved suppressor and also observed some cricket bombs. Have you ever heard of a cricket bomb? No, it's the first time. I had not either, but apparently it's when you take a... So, eh, kind of interesting. YouTube will not allow any of that. Are you serious? Oh, no. Why? <laughs> And we had to cut all that. So um, we had a discussion about YouTube policies. So this comes up in criminal cases all the time. The CIs, they make this sound so much juicier than it is because ultimately, so he goes in, he says there's machine guns, there's bombs, there's I'm um, doing these controlled buys for suppressors. Um, when they actually go in and they get a search warrant for his place, uh, they don't really come up with a whole lot. Oh, also, he likes to smoke meth. Oh, yeah, that was, that was part of it. Which will be important yes. later on. Yeah. So, yeah, they go and they descend on his house with 20 officers, uh, 20 officers. But it's very funny because apparently the main ATF agent kept telling the guy, look, even though there's 20 officers milling around you and your parents' property, you're still free to leave. You are not under detention. Oh, yeah. Uh, allow me to me read you your Miranda warnings. But once again, not under arrest. Yeah. And, th and that's kind of the subject of the motion to suppress. So a motion to suppress is when you're asking the court for relief. So you're saying, hey, exclude this illegally obtained evidence because, you know, one of my constitutional rights were violated. Now, anytime you have 20 officers lording over you, anytime you're getting Miranda warnings to you, that is a good indication that you are not free to go, that you are being arrested, that you are being interrogated. And that's the time to invoke your rights, invoke your right to an attorney, invoke your right to remain silent, uh, only communicate to law enforcement through an attorney at that point going forward. And the court ultimately, uh, you know, shrugs off this motion to suppress. Hey, there's really nothing to this. Your rights weren't violated. But buried in there were two motions to dismiss the indictments against him because ultimately, even though we heard about all those crazy different things that he was, you know, allegedly involved in, uh, what did they end up charging him with? Well, they wound up charging him with possession of a firearm by a prohibited person, a uh, prohibited person, him being a drug user, yep. uh, even though they were not there to look for drugs. And then they also charged him with the possession of one unregistered short barreled rifle. Yeah. So no. No, no suppressor no parts. No suppressor parts, no machine guns, no, machine no guns. bombs. I mean, they... No, they didn't no censored cricket bombs. All right. So in this, hey, asking to dismiss the indictments uh, against him, you know, essentially, uh, Danielson is relying, or he attempts to rely on New York State Rifle and Pistol Association v. Bruin. And the court does this very brief analysis 
where I think it makes two ridiculous statements. I can't decide which one is more ridiculous. We'd love to hear from you all in the comment section below. But the first one is, is that the Second Amendment, as applied by Heller, only applies to the law abiding. Right. And of course, the judge engaging in circular logic said, well, he had all this stuff, so clearly he's not law abiding. Therefore, he's not even a protected person under the Second Amendment. Yeah, that's exactly what I would call it. Circular logic. Hey, you violated the law that may violate the Second Amendment, but because you violated the law, you can't be law abiding and therefore aren't protected by the Second Amendment. It makes absolutely no sense. The second thing the court that goes goes on to say that it leaves me a little bit flabbergasted because, you know, we know this isn't the case. They relied a lot on Heller. They say, yes, we understand. We got this new New York State Rifle and Pistol Association v. Bruin case, you know, but that does not alter Heller, which that doesn't make any sense. No, it doesn't. Because, of course, we all know that Bruin did alter Heller because the one big, you know, Heller made, Heller was very good in that it laid a good foundation, made a lot of pronouncements about the right, uh, the Second Amendment is an individual right that is based upon an individual's uh, right to self-defense. But it left a huge hole where it did not give any uh, it did not give any framework for analyzing whether or not a case violated the Second Amendment, which, of course, is the big hole that Bruin filled. So it did alter Heller in that it clarified it and it makes it useful for courts going forward. Uh, but apparently this court just chose to disregard that and still make it was as if he couldn't be bothered to read Bruin and was just going to go on the old Heller rulings. Yeah. And just doing a big, you know, where we are in 2023, we have, you know, over 700 cases citing New York State Rifle and Pistol Association v. Bruin. Hundreds of those negatively saying we are declining to follow this. I don't know how we have a, any lower courts declining to follow this case, but we have quite a few with what we call negative treatment when you're analyzing, you know, how how these you know courts are treating each other. And and this is how it comes up too. So for example, let's say the Ninth Circuit chooses not to follow New York State Rifle and Pistol Association. That kind of green lights all all the district courts in the Ninth Circuit to say, well, we're following what the Ninth Circuit precedent is. So it does create a quite a bit of confusion, but I think this case is really, even though this, you know, we don't have an ultimate outcome on this case, you know, a sentence imposed, whether the, you know, Mr. Da uh, Danielson is even found guilty. Um, this is just a procedural. We see how these things are being handled procedurally in the court. Yes. Yeah, so it'll be interesting to see uh, if his attorneys pursue this denial of the motion to dismiss, because keep in mind, it's very important to look at the two charges he's charged with. Number one, being a prohibited person because they say he's on drugs. So is that a is that a restriction of the Second Amendment, we saying have, that people who aren't on drugs can't have weapons? Yeah, we have we have a couple of different circuits saying that that statute itself is unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. And whether or not possession of a short-barreled rifle can be regulated in the manner it is. Is a short-barreled rifle so unique or so much more dangerous than a regular rifle? Or a pistol. <laughs> or a pistol that it deserves to be specially regulated. And so those are the two laws he's challenging. So all this other stuff about him building secret suppressors and altering guns to become machine guns. And that may be interesting, but for the purpose of second amendment analysis, it's not relevant. But we hope you enjoyed this discussion. If you did consider subscribing, hitting that like button and help us fight the anti 2 a algorithm by sharing this video. And as always, we appreciate your questions and comments down below. And until next time, we're the armed attorneys. Everyone, Over the just, word just, cricket just, mom. Just, just do a bleep and then his whole description. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. They won't let you talk about that. They won't let you talk about cricket moms. <laughs> you can't tell people how to build a bomb on the I don't know how to build it. I'm just saying what the opinion says it is. <laughs> sure. You can't say it. You just did. You said bomb too. Okay. All right. Yeah. You can't, you can't say bomb on an airplane. Bomb, 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 bomb. Okay. All right. All right. So big. <laughs>